Right, here goes. Shark Hanlon has had his suspension reduced on appeal. David, just give us the details, first of all. Right, well, there was a 10-month ban and a €2,000 fine imposed on Shark Hanlon for an incident back in June whereby he was transporting a dead horse in a trailer pulled by a branded lorry. Uh, the tarpaulin was removed and therefore the carcass of the horse was on view to the uh, general public. Uh, in a traffic jam, this was filmed by someone in the car behind mm. and this led to the punishment, which was reduced this week to six months, three suspended, and came after the day that Shark Hanlon had set, sent 15 horses to the sale. Now, the IHRB gave themselves 14 days to issue the result of the appeal. They didn't use all those 14 days. Is there any case to say, Fran, that their decision could have been expedited at least to the point where Shark Handler would have known the severity of his suspension before those horses went through the sale ring? Potentially, Nick, but did he give himself an out or a, a window of opportunity of 14 days? Mm. did say when the initial result of the hearing came out that they're going to consider all the new evidence that was brought to the table. Uh, timing with selling the horses was not ideal, but... Um, they were in full knowledge those horses yeah, were going to go through the ring. Exactly. So, and in fact, it came out that a day after the sale wasn't ideal. It's a pretty comprehensive report when you read it and read down through the subsequent uh, reports come out with the reduction in the ban and um, the timing with selling the horse was not ideal, but I think, uh, on balance, the right result has probably been got. The right result in terms of a reduction of suspension? The penalty, I think, is more fair, I think, than given, given the initial penalty looked like it was going to really have a negative impact on the overall career of Shark Hanlon. I think what it is at now is, I think it's pretty fair, yeah. What's your view on that, Dave? I like suspended sentences in full, really. I, I would say... We're giving you a 12-month ban suspended for two years, and if anything like this happens again, you essentially will be finished for a year. Um, I, I don't like... I, I still think it's harsh, to be quite honest. I think that three months... Um, it, it, Shark Hanlon has benefited greatly from social media, and this was one instance where it became his downfall. He should have known that you should you know, make sure that tarpaulin didn't shift, and he was negligent. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Is, is a punishment of six months or even three months, is that... Uh, does the punishment, punishment fit the crime? Personally, I, I don't think it does. I would have given a heavier sentence suspended in full. But, you know, I'd, again, it's not one of those Wensbury unreasonableness cases, in my view, whereby it's so unreasonable that no one could have come to that conclusion. So I, I can see it both ways. OK, Danny Todhope has split from Clipper Logistics, who were his retaining owner for uh, many years. And, of course, their uh, collaboration reached its uh, apogee when Fallen Angel was a, a classic winner for them earlier in the season. She's subsequently been sold. Uh, Danny Todhope, uh, it seems, has just sort of parted ways by benign neglect, really. It's sort of come to a fizzled out more than anything else. And as he said, that coincided with a sort of precipitous decline in the number of horses that Steve Parkin's Clipper Logistics operation was, was owning. At the same time, Fran, uh, Steve Parkin is engaged in a bitter uh, a tussle in the High Court in Ireland with uh, Joe Foley, who was his business partner at Ballyhane Stud for, for many years, and they're uh, debating, amongst many other things, the, the ownership of Sands of Marley, the, the stallion. What now do we think? For, for, for Clipper? Uh, when you mentioned Daddy Tudop, obviously he's going to Dubai and his association with Clipper, when they were getting going, it really brought Danny to a new level, or riding a different class of horse. Got him into various yards in the north of England, also in the south of England. He had great success. He rode Royal Asco winners for Steve yeah. Park and uh, Irish Champions Festival. He's ridden winners there in the past in the Clipper Logistics mile, of course. And it put his name in the mix, didn't it, in big races? Uh, exactly. It just put him up a division, if you like, and it's, it really brought him to the fore. And uh, every opportunity he had riding a clipper horse and made the most of it. I think the writing was on the wall when Fallen Angel was sold and transferred to what non racing. That was a sure sign if the best horse are going out the door, dwindling numbers, the jockey is probably the next one that was going to just uh, fizzle out, if you like, yeah. But it, it's extraordinary, isn't it, David, that an operation that we were considering as having potential to burgeon into a real behemoth is now shriveling before our eyes, it seems. Well, when you look at Fallen Angel, uh, winning the, the Moigle Stud Stakes and then the Irish Guineas. This seemed to be now from Steve... I'm putting myself in Steve Parkin's shoes. This is 
where I want to be and now I build on this. And to be in this very, very different situation a few months on is very odd. Uh, the, the, the sale of Fallen Angel, uh, the withdrawal of the sponsorship, um, it's, it, it, one wonders what's going to happen next. With Danny Tudhope, he's 38, that's not old for a jockey, as Jimmy Quinn will tell us in a few moments' time, I'm sure. And uh, has banged in another century of winners and, and is, for, for a guy who doesn't blow his own trumpet, is very now firmly established in the elite of his profession. This might be one of the, the greatest strap lines on a talking point ever. I mean, props to my producer for this one. <coughs> Banned jockey gets banned. <laughs> David, explain. Yeah, this is um, a story uh, before the, the BHA this week, and I'm referring to my note. Shane Fenlon, who mm. is a uh, jockey in Ireland, was serving a two-day whip ban and came over to ride Alan DeBanks to victory in a bumper, I think it was at Newton Abbott. And, um, of course, he shouldn't have been riding because he was already banned. Uh, this went to the BHA. Charlotte Davidson for the BHA said this case was extremely straightforward. That view fairly obviously wasn't shared by opposing counsel mm. uh, Samuel Cuthbert. Um, the, the nuts and bolts of it were that uh, Peter Bowen had rung the BHA and said, is this guy banned? And someone <laughs> just on the phone said, no, I think he's fine, he's all right to run. <laughs> and then um, whilst uh, Shane Fenlon was on the scales, apparently, someone at the race course said, just sign this to, you know, make sure mm. you're OK to ride. He didn't really pay it any attention, just signed his own name. And this was used by uh, Shane Fenlon's counsel to say, well, he, you know, he thought he had permission to ride uh, with Peter Bowen ringing the BHA. But, of course, as, uh, as it was ruled that... Um, of course, he wasn't. Right. Whose fault is this? It, it, it's 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 with the jockey and the and the connections of the horse. Clearly, you know you you have to if 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 you're serving a ban, the jockey should have known. Ignorance of the law is no defence, as we know that 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 ban would be reciprocated by the BHA and just ringing the BHA and expecting <laughs> expecting them to have a, a list of every jockey who is banned in racing jurisdictions with who have a reciprocal arrangement with the BHA is obviously stretching it. Uh, but surely they could just type the name in and go, yeah, he's banned. Well, that's the thing. There's no, first of all, there's no malice in anything that happened. It was just Shane Fallon ignorantly thinking he could ride and should have been well aware of it. So, he wasn't, so you think he wasn't trying to pull a fast one? I don't think so. I, th I think from what I can hear on the ground at home that he thought the ban was for Ireland, not England. And it was an innocent mistake. So he didn't realise there was international reciprocity? No. Yeah, that that I, seems to be the general verdict. I, I, I'm, I think we all row in with that. I don't think there was any no. attempt to... He thought, well, I'm, I'm banned in Ireland, I'll go and ride in, in Britain. But that, obviously, that isn't how it... But how, how did it get to that stage? You said modern commu communication. I know. How, how did it get there? Not, not a phone call, it should be a system that it should go red. That's a, you I just mean, shouldn't be able to declare a banned jockey on a horse. It should just ping straight back at right, you, that, I mean, it? That's an extremely good point, in that th there is surely the computer software with uh, every jurisdiction where you have a reciprocal... Uh, arrangement that you could type in the name of the, the, the surname of the document and say, all oh, right, no, I, this, this guy is this guy's serving a ban in it's, Ireland. It's so a bit we'll... like when, they, when somebody loses a claim or seven to five, five to three, and they say, oh, well, you were still claiming five and you were supposed to be claiming three that day, and it, it's on you, the jockey, mm. to know how many pounds you're supposed to be claiming. Surely the system should be in yeah. place to, to, to be idiot-proof. Well, it's just putting a passing the book back to the jockey if the problem becomes his personal responsibility, but it shouldn't get to that stage. Mm. You said the system should be there. Wayne has to this year, the same happened with him, riding away with, with the wrong claim for a few days. It shouldn't happen. Because at, at the end of it, who, who's losing out? The betters are losing out in, in cases like this. So do everything you can to try and make the situation more straightforward and you wouldn't end up in situations like this. Um, speaking of um, punters losing out, a gambling commission of... Um, made an interesting intervention within the last seven days, Dave, on black market betting. Now, you'll remember Andrew Rhodes, 
boss of the Gambling Commission, came on this show and I talked to him about black market betting and he was quite clear that he felt that the dangers of that had been overstated by the gambling industry in order to offset the incoming affordability legislation. Uh, now he seems to have changed his tune. Yeah, this is an interesting story in two parts, actually. Um, Andrew Rhodes said that the, the Gambling Commission will increase its use of data to, uh, to combat um, gambling on the black market. Uh, we are particularly vigilant in our work to disrupt to disrupt this market, he said, um, that they had, their work had already achieved 750 cease and desist notices to black market operators and also 50,000 URLs had been removed by Google. Now, as you say, this is interesting in two ways. The first is that the issue of black market gambling, which was uh, estimated earlier this week, I think at £4 billion a year in turnover, was uh, Andrew Rhodes has said on many times, more than one occasion, that he feels that that is an exagger or that the the idea of black market gambling has been exaggerated. Um, the other thing, of course, is that one of the routes into the black market, not the only route, because bookmakers don't lay every bet and, and these days restrict punters more than they should do. Uh, but the other, uh, another route into it is uh, via affordability mm. checks where, of course, uh, punters are restricted from gambling with, uh, uh, with licensed operators, so they go elsewhere. OK. Fran? Just an ongoing issue, isn't it, with the Gambling Commission? Are they aware of everything that's going on with the bigger picture of the gambling industry in England? From what I see, this your podcast every week, through the week, they're not really across everything and it seems to be just bit by bit catching up with what's going on. Hopefully it turns the corner for racing in general. All right, let's move on. Frankie Dottori and John Gosden are reunited, courtesy of Emily Up, John. And uh, Gosden is uh, targeting the Breeders' Cup turf uh, on Saturday in preference to the Philly and Mare turf. So 12 furlongs instead of 11 furlongs for Emily Up, John. And Frankie Dottori riding is the, <coughs> is the main story here, um, Fran. Have they done the right thing, saying, Frankie, get back on? Kieran Schumacher doesn't get his chance to ride her in the, in the filly and mare turf, in the, in the turf? It was kind of the cards, wasn't it? Um, given that she hasn't won a race this year and her last win came in the Coronation Cup under Frankie de Tori as well. Um, she's been knocking at the door this year and getting probably to her last roll of the dice, I would imagine, at Del Mar. Frankie's there. Maybe connections are thinking, we don't have much to lose by putting a man that's had the best success on, her on board. It's hard in Kieran Schumark, but it's a little bit in spiral, the way things have developed with her this year. She'll be gone next year, Kieran will be well settled into the job on that point. Won't be easy to watch it, but it's just the nature of the beast at present. And the ownership have, have said it's very much John Gosden's decision. John Gosden has owned this decision as well, David. He hasn't tried to hide behind the owners. He said, it's my decision. Um, Frankie's there, he knows the track, Kieran doesn't know the track, he knows the track and the Philly simple as that. Look, there are lots of issues over the years of jockeys being taken over or jocked off by bigger name jockeys. Fran, I'm sure it happened to you in both directions. Mm. And in this case, I would say for Kieran Schumer, I'd be, I'd be amazed if he lost one moment's sleep over this. I mean, obviously, the second half of the season has gone well for him. He's He's ridden that elusive Group 1 winner for Clarehaven um, at Longchamp earlier this month. Now, I don't think he would have expected to ride this horse. I think that he would have been fully aware that Frankie is the, the favourite to ride Emily Upjohn at, at Del Mar. What about the race itself? Mm. He, effectively, he's saying, I'm going to run in the race where I'm a 5-1 to one shot, not in a race where I'm a 5-2 to two shot. Phillies and Mares looked an open goal, not an open goal, well, but looked, uh, looks more, yeah, looks more, easier, more winnable. Yeah. It's a furlong shy. John Gosling feeling she needs every yard of the mile and a half at Del Mar, but it's against in, better opposition. Interesting. I know she won a Coronation Cup at Epsom, but ten furlongs in the pretty poly just wore down by Blue Stocking later on. She's not a slow filly. <clears throat> she can travel very well in the speed as well. So you'd imagine what's the difference of a furlong for her, given she does travel well. Whereas in comparison, taking on the Colts. It's just going to be a different test for her as well. And given her current form, is she's as good as last year, I would have been looking at the Phillies more so than the open race. You'd have jumped the other way? I think so. OK. Um, still can, of course, if they want to change their mind at the 11th hour. If you put two preferences, it doesn't matter which one you take, even whether you put first or second preference. Can City of Troy do it? That really is the key talking point. David Yates, will this horse win the Breeders' Cup Classic? <laughs> I haven't got a clue. Um, no, that's not no. It's, it's either a yes or a no. No, it's... Well, it, 
<laughs> I'm not going to give you a yes or a no. <laughs> what we can say is that this would be a... Um, th this would be new ground for Aidan O'Brien, wouldn't it? And that is very rare. Uh, European winners of the Breeders' Cup Classic, Arkong in 93, when on, it was a dirt race yeah. for Andre Fabre and Raven's Pass, Pass when it was on years later. Pro Ride, asterisk pro against that. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so, you know, we're, we're used to some, sometimes the, with the behemoth stables flat and jumps, it, be, it can become a bit repetitive mm -hmm. writing about this is his ninth, tenth, eleventh derby winner. Um, but this is a, of genuine interest because it's a peak that he's not scaled before and has, and has come agonising, agonisingly close to it. I mean, horses who've gone dangerously close to winning the Breeders' Cup Classic on dirt. Toast of New York, who could have been awarded it if the stewards have been in a better mood that day. <laughs> uh, declaration of war, if he changed his leads at the right time, might have won. If Frankie had put his whip down on Swain, he might have won the race. Saki might have won, but for coming up against Tiz now and an inspired McCarran with his second victory. And, of course, Giants Causeway went down by, by a nose as well. So the defeats are almost as heroic as some mm. of the Breeders' Cup victories. And, and it has been that they've gone close a number of occasions. Declaration War actually forgot about him, how well he did run that occasion. And uh, Giants Causeway, that Tiz now battle, of course, being a standout as well. And it's an interesting one with the Coolmore partners. Obviously, he's by Justify, but they're really rolling the dice. But it's a shot to nothing for me. He's done what he's done all the way through this year, mm. redeemed himself, winning at Epsom, winning the Eclipse and then York, which was a fantastic performance. So given the breeding, they're going for gold, a bit like Augusto Rodin going to the Japan Cup run, going for the turf race on next Saturday. It's, is it adventurous or is it just going for see can it be done with your best colts? I get what you're saying, it's a shot to nothing insofar as they've already got everything for the mm. Stallion brochure. Champion two-year-old, <laughs> record-breaking, Judmont International winner. That's all there. But in terms of legacy, and reputation is not a shot to nothing, is it? No, it's a, it's a very important thing. It, I mean, I suppose a shot to nothing, that phrase, means yeah. that if it doesn't come off well, You're not gonna lose we're, we're OK, you know, never mind. But oh. they, they will be... Th there'll be some very, very long faces yeah. and, uh, and they'll be in a very dull temperament as a result of oh. a defeat, oh. wouldn't they, I on think, Saturday night? I think it's kind of a sh shot to nothing for Coolmore, in a way, in in a commercial sense, because it's either that or it's that. It's not going to go down there. Mm. For Aidan O'Brien, it's not a shot to nothing, isn't it? Because he staked a lot of personal faith and reputation in this. You know, to everyone who has cast doubt, he has come out, chest out, yeah. and saying, you know, I, my belief in this horse is unshakable. Sure. It, and this is more than just stallion puff, isn't it? it yeah, it is. We, we should just address this, though. Like, there's been a bit of troublemaking over the last couple of weeks about people who are saying, and, and Lydia did it at a new market a couple of weeks ago, just pointing out that in terms of ratings, is it 19 mm. uh, time form uh, uh, horses that trained by Aidan O'Brien? Have an officially high rating. Racing post ratings, uh, a similar, a smaller but similar number. It's not cynic cynicism or, or uh, troublemaking to suggest that, to, to ask Aidan O'Brien, well, on the figures, this horse is still a fair way shy of the, the, the private handicappers who are hugely respected at time form and the racing post. So let, let's sort of put that to bed. It's a perfectly legitimate question. But that's what I mean, is that's why I think for him it's, it's more than, it's more than a, a roll of the dice. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, yeah. It'd be, it's it's um, something that he feels yeah, yeah. you can see very, very intensely. And so it, he, he will be watching that race, I would say, with more... Um, nerves than perhaps any other in in history. Yeah, and it's all going to be decided, I think, in the first 25 seconds, really. What, whatever develops for him out of starting stalls, depending on the gate position, how he gets to that first bend, if he copes with a kickback, if he can't lead. Um, you know, it could all be over literally in a matter of 300 metres. How big a deal do you think it would be for the sport globally if he were to do it? It'd be a huge boost to North American dirt racing. If he were to go and do it, it'll encourage people to go and roll the dice, give it a go, and you're only using that saying again, but were he to go and do it, being one of our top turf performing three roads on the back of an Epsom Derby win, it uh, would, yeah, I think it would garner a lot of headlines as well. Might want us crying out for more to keep him in training next year. That's not going to happen, but uh, if he were to go and win, it'd be huge news. But he's got not only the Americans take on, Nick, he's got the Japanese take on as well, and they've got a strong hand there as well. And if you ever wanted somebody to 
write about potentially one of the most dramatic moments in horse racing history. Step forward, Alistair Down, who was honoured this week by Cheltenham Racecourse, the new um, Alistair, well, it's not, it's not a new press room, but it has been rebranded, re, re, he'd hate rebranded, it has been renamed the Alistair Down um, press room at Cheltenham, which is a, a lovely touch, and you were there on Friday to, to see him open it. Yeah, it was a very nice touch. Um, Alistair, for so many of us, for so many years, has been someone that we've looked up to, and obviously there is a, a, a sometimes healthy, sometimes not so healthy competition in the press room, um, and... I think we've all read his stuff, or most of us, I think, have read it and thought, I, I wish I could write like that. He he's, he's chronicled um, the, the, the drama of, of horse racing so beautifully over the last few decades. And it was a, a really nice touch of, of Cheltenham. Joe Rendell of the Jockey Club was... was uh, Incidentally, it was very much behind uh, this whole project, and um, it, it was it was great to be there. Uh, instrumental, instrumental. Thank you. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. He's definitely not incidental. <laughs> Alistair would have I, said instrumental. Um, I think in the in the nineties, Cheltenham's profile went up three or four notches, and it coincided with a number of things. It, Channel Four taking the coverage in nineteen ninety five, um, and Andrew Franklin's commitment to to Cheltenham. Uh, Alistair was a huge part of the coverage of that from, from the late 90s. Um, and I think the way he wrote and broadcast about Cheltenham was a huge driver in where that, why, why Cheltenham's brand is so strong now. That, that's my feeling about yeah, it. I, I, and why, in a sense, jump racing has become so popular almost at the expense of flat race. Absolutely. And, and that's why it was so fitting that, that Cheltenham... Would, would do this for Alistair. You could have chosen, it's, it's not the only uh, press room where people write about big horse races in Britain. It could have been Epsom, Newmarket, Aintree, which of course is the Allen. Well, your would Epsom. have been his other favoured yeah, one, wouldn't it? but it, it was fitting that uh, it was Cheltenham. I just hope I get the urinals at, uh, at Plumpton <laughs> one day, Fran. You know, fingers crossed. I, I got them dog sorted anyway, so... <laughs> the best. The Bedford Fox urinals. <laughs> now there's a thought. Those were this week's talking points. It's as if we've been gone forever, but soon it'll feel like we've never been away. It's showtime.